Frequency separation is a powerful retouching method in Adobe Photoshop, and it gives you the control of an artist to truly transform your photography and bring your artistic vision to life. Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. I'm David Bird with Reality Reimagine, and we're going to continue the glorious adventure of frequency separation today by working with the traditional brush in Photoshop. But before we dive into Photoshop, I would like to ask for your help in growing this channel on YouTube. Liking this video and subscribing to the channel lets YouTube and the vast audiences on this platform know that there is great content to be found here and great education to be found in photography and Photoshop. So please consider liking the video and subscribing and when you do subscribe make sure to click the bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos go live to the channel especially videos that explore the wonderful power of frequency separation which is what we're going to do today so let's dive into photoshop and begin the journey so in the previous video, we had talked about using the mixer brush to be able to smooth the colors together so that the transitions between colors would blend more softly and give a more soft, beautiful look to our image. And now we're going to use the basic brush tool to introduce new colors and continue that effort of smoothing colors together within our image. So I'm going to come to this blank layer in the layer stack for frequency separation, which by the way, if you don't know how to create the layers for frequency separation, please visit the video above that will demonstrate how to populate all these layers for frequency separation 16-bit in Adobe Photoshop. It also uses the new method of median noise instead of the older method of Gaussian blur. So update your knowledge, update your actions by visiting that video above. So on this blank layer, I'm going to hit B for brush, and I'm going to simply use the most basic brush of Photoshop to start painting into this image, just like a traditional painter would. I'm going to use my artistic mind to start deciding where do I want some transitions of highlight and shadow to come into play? Where do I want to potentially call attention to some of the three-dimensional nature of her face? And where do I want to augment a little bit of the lighting pattern? This is a Rembrandt lighting pattern where we simply have a triangle of soft light that is on the opposite side of the model's face or the subject's face from the broad side of the face where all the light is coming into play. So I can augment this just a little bit and start painting in just a little bit more lighter tones within that area and call attention to that lighting pattern of Rembrandt style by using frequency separation. Because again, we're painting on a blank layer that is below the detail layer, but above the color layer. So by using the basic brush on this layer, we can introduce new colors. The details are preserved, but they're above the existing colors and we can work with those two sets of layers to blend and get a good result. So part of the function of the basic brush utilized in frequency separation is to be able to flip back and forth to the eyedropper tool because we want to sample existing color that is in the scene and use that color to paint it into our picture. So before we begin this, I want to go to the eyedropper tool itself in our tools palette window here. As you can see, it will when you mouse over a tool in Photoshop, it'll give you a little flyout window that demonstrates what the tool does. I'm gonna click it to activate it, and up here are the controls for it. So simply, it's going to be a sample size and then sample all layers. And we want that to be in play. We want to be able to sample all layers within our document. This little box being checked says show sampling ring. It just shows you, you know, where the tool is actually gonna work in the image. But here is the most important part of the eyedropper tool and it's the sample size. I believe that Photoshop defaults to point sample. That means that when we use it to sample colors within the image, let's zoom in. We're gonna go down to the pixel level. If it's on point sample, the eyedropper tool is going to sample one square, one pixel as its source. If we're using it to sample colors within a zone for retouching, this is not an accurate representation of what we see because we can see multiple colors here. And keep in mind, we're zoomed in all the way down. Let's take like two or three steps backward, zooming out by hitting control or command and the minus key. One, two. How many colors do we see here? Some of them are similar, yes, but many of them are different from each other. Yes, they're all in the skin tone color family, so to speak, but there's so many different colors. Let's keep zooming out. This is such a small little portion of this image. We need a better sample. So I highly encourage you, change the sample size 
from point sample to either 3x3, 5x5, or even 11x11. 11 11. Most of the time I'm on 5x5 average, but I will sometimes go to 11x11 11 11 when I'm working on any kind of fantasy work or kind of cosplay composite work, which is another part of the work that I typically do with Reality Reimagined. But 5x5 five five average is generally a good place to start. So once you have made that change by coming to the actual eyedropper tool and then changing it here and hitting enter and accepting that, then when you're on the basic brush tool, I'm hitting B to go to the basic brush. I have all the controls of the brush and we'll go over that for a second. But when I'm using the basic brush, B for brush, if I hold alt or option, it will default the brush to the eyedropper tool so I can sample. I won't see the controls of the eyedropper tool up here. It will stay on the brush controls, but I know that the eyedropper tool now is sampling a five by five average. Again, hitting alter option from the brush tool will default to the eyedropper tool so you can make those selections for color. So let's go over just very quickly with the brush tool itself. These are the controls for the brush. We're going to be using a very soft brush. The hardness is set to zero. And then our blending mode of our brush right now is set to normal. And this is something that we will be exploring in future videos on the retouching series for YouTube. So consider subscribing to the channel because brushes blending modes have incredibly amazing results and can save you a lot of time depending upon the certain things you're doing in Photoshop. Opacity and flow, as I said in the previous video, when I'm using the basic brush to paint, I leave my opacity set to 100%. I always leave it there. I change the flow of my brush. I will either be at 100%, I'll go down to 10%, or sometimes 1%, and we'll probably be painting with 1% today. Um, the other icons don't really come into play for this, but they do have different functions. It's worth exploring on your own, but I keep these uh, as they are right now. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And what I want to do is I want to start softening some of the color through here under her eye. Now keep in mind, Highlight and shadow, brighter colors, darker colors, designate three dimensions within the image. I do not want to paint out these dark colors completely. I need them there because it tells us, it tells the audience and viewer that there is three dimensions here to her eyelid. We have brighter colors in the top and then we have the darker colors in the bottom. If we get rid of that complete shadow, it will look like she's not real or too fake or plastic. You can go too far with this. So I always say subtlety is key when you're working in Photoshop. Smaller gestures, smaller changes to the image as they are built up make a beautiful picture. So B for brush, I'm gonna turn off the mouse tracker here. Let's make my brush just a little bit smaller and I'm going to sample some of the lighter tones through here. I'm holding alter option to defer to the eyedropper tool. I don't wanna to come to this bright color in the highlight because it will just make everything bright. This is a, let's say a mid-tone. Through here in this zone, this is the highlight, this is the midtone, and this is the shadow of color. I want to simply even out those shadows a little bit more. So I'm going to sample and click once, and it's going to change my foreground color to a five by five average of what it sampled. Now, I'm gonna make my brush a little bit smaller, and I'm going to change my flow of my brush. It's at 100% right now, I'm gonna change it to 1%. And I've talked about this in a previous video, but to reiterate, if I come up to this dialogue and move this little slider down, I can get to 1% very quickly. I just drag it all the way to the left. But sometimes that can be hard to do if you wanna get it to like, let's say 10% and you drag it, it's hard sometimes to get my mouse to land. No, there we go, 10%, lovely. You can use hotkeys to move the flow and opacity of the brushes. So specifically for flow, if I were to hit shift and the number one, it'll take it to 10%, shift and zero, it will take it to 100%. If I were to hit shift, zero and one all at the same time, it takes it to 1%, that single digit. So now I'm on this blank layer here, below the detail layer, above the color layer, I'm going to start painting at 1% directly over the shadow region. And at 1%, I'm getting very little paint that it's putting down. Plus, I'm using a Wacom Intuos Pro pen tablet. It has pressure sensitivity built into it. So the lighter I touch this pen to the tablet, the lighter it's putting down paint into the image itself. So let's continue painting. But notice I'm making my brush, I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit more so you can see. I'm making my brush just a little bit smaller now because I'm trying to protect this little shadow region through here. I needed it to be there. I've painted over it already one time. 
but now I need that to be there, but I just want to soften and minimize the distance of how much it's traveling. Because the more shadow we see in this particular region of the eye, the more we're going to think bags under the eyes. So I'm going to paint right at the base. And this is not using any kind of content aware or anything to that nature. It's simply using actual paint, actual color to put it down. Well, it's not actual paint. This is Photoshop, but it's putting down color that's covering up that area. And I get to sculpt and control what we see in this image like a painter, like a traditional artist would. I'm coming now to that outer perimeter edge of that shadowy area and just smoothing out the transition so that we see all of those midtones that came through but we got right to the edge of the eye and it's protected. And I can even go one step further. I can move up just a little bit and sample a darker tone of skin. Now this has got some makeup on it, so it might be potentially a little bit of a different color shift, but that's okay. I'm going to come up here, hit alter option, sample this darker tone, and then I'm going to make my brush really small. And keep in mind, we're painting with a flow of 1%. I'm just gonna come down here and augment that color just a little bit more to create more of that sense of three dimension. I'm using the basic brush right now to do this and to paint in a little bit more of that shadow. I could also use a very powerful retouching technique called dodging and burning to do the same thing. And dodging and burning is going to be what we explore in the next video of the retouching series. So let's continue to look around the image and just look for areas where we can use basic color to just start smoothing things out. I don't want to replace anything. I'm not a retoucher that goes too far. I've talked about this in the previous videos. I talk about this all the time when I teach at conferences. You have to retouch with the expectations of your client in mind, but you have to be responsible with it. Don't go too far. You build up too far. One, the audience's focus is always going to go to that one thing you do too much of within the image, too much of the retouching. It's typically when people whiten the eyes of somebody in a picture. They'll make the whites of the eyes so bright that no matter what else they do to the image, that's all we can focus on. If we remove too much shadow within the image, if we only go to the highlights, it's going to look fake. It's not going to look real. Good retouching can drive the audience's view to the specific areas within an image that we want them to see. So I'm going to hit B for brush just to make sure we're on it. I'm going to sample some lighter tones because right through here, I can see just a little bit of variation of color. That again is showing us the sense of three-dimensionality that where the corner of her mouth meets her face and it just droops down just a little bit. That's fine. It's not a major, uh, major color disparity, but I just want to smooth it out just a little bit. I've sampled that mid-tone of color, if you will, and I'm just smoothing it out. Now I'm going to come down to these areas through here and get a nice little five by five average and just paint in just a little bit of color and softly feather it out. As I get down here where I want the effect to feather out in a way, I'm just gently touching my pen to the tablet. And again, at 1% flow, it's putting down just a minimal amount of paint, just a little bit of a change. And if my brush really big and just make a couple of broad gestures again to feather out that effect. Now let's look, let's see, again, we can take some of these lighter tones that we see here and we can just do the same thing here just to smooth this out just a little bit. We're not trying to replace any of the three dimensionality in her face, just softening out those transitions, sampling the highlights that we see here on her nose and just augmenting it a little bit, filling in any little gaps. So it takes the same overall shape, this shape that we can see through here that mimics the flow and curvature of her nose. It's just a soft little bit of a retouch. We can come down here into the shadows where that original blemish was at was right there. We can augment these shadows just a little bit, sample these areas through here, and just use the basic brush to overcome some, just a little bit of that highlight region that was still left over when we used the mixer brush to blend colors uh, when we got rid of the blemish itself. Now I can feather up and bring some color, some lighter tones up and just try to make this little transition at the top of her nose into the transition of her forehead, just a little bit of a small, softer transition itself. So let's control minus and zoom back out. I'm gonna come uh, right here. And again, I'm just looking for any areas of color that just kind of stand out to be just a shade or two darker than the surrounding area and consider, is that something that I can soften out by just painting some colors and feathering it all together as I'm doing right now on the screen itself. So this is how I would retouch this entire image. 
I would go throughout her body and just making sure to blend in some colors and not just for the skin. I would do it for the clothing itself and help the clothing just to blend with some brighter colors, some darker colors. Now, when you work with clothing, you have to be careful how much color you paint in because if we zoom in just a little bit, the individual lines and ridges within this material are much, much darker. And that repetitive pattern shows us that there is a weave of cloth. If we cover up all that black, that darker tone between the sections of cloth, it's not going to look very real. It's going to, again, look flat and fake. It's in, in many ways the same principle of working on somebody's face by retouching. So again, this method could also be used on backdrops. As we look at the backdrop right now, I can see there's a subtle color variation right through here because there's just a little bit of a crinkle in the paper itself. So all I have to do is hit B for brush, sample an area that's nearby, and just gently painting at 1%, making my brush really big, just making a couple of little gestures like this to fill in that little shadowy region and even it all out. And again, at a flow of 1%, it lets me build it up. If you want to go faster, if you need to go faster, if you're just proofing something for someone or whatever else, or whatever other needs you have for efficiency, you can go faster by just simply increasing the flow of the basic brush. But when I'm retouching and using frequency separation, very, very rarely does my flow go above 10%. It usually stays right around 10% because I need that control. I need to build it up. So let's zoom in just a little bit, not that much. Let's come back out just a little bit and we'll take a look at this view with a before and after. This is the after where we've gently painted on a blank layer introducing new colors and before. See how we're just overcoming just, just subtle variations, small little areas where the colors are just a little darker so that we can see good results and blend things together. Again, trying to achieve that smooth movement of color that flows through her face that makes a beautiful retouch and a beautiful image. So let's take a step back and we'll do a little bit of a recap. Again, we've used the basic brush as a traditional artist would to paint in new colors into this image in frequency separation. Using our artistic judgment and our artistic mind to see areas of highlight and shadow that we can either augment or soften just a little bit so we have a smooth, flowing, pleasing shape to the image that we're retouching in Adobe Photoshop. That concludes this video for today. Thank you so much for watching it. Thank you for watching the retouching series. I must stress to you that one of the greatest tips I can ever give you, one of the greatest secrets you can ever learn about Photoshop is you have to practice. You have to practice as, as, as much as you possibly can because you'll retain all of these skills and variations to them. You'll learn how to integrate these tools, these techniques into your artistic workflow, and it will make you a better artist faster inside of Adobe Photoshop if you practice. Please consider helping me to grow this channel on YouTube by liking this video and subscribing. Make sure to click the bell icon so you'll be notified when the next video comes into play for the retouching series, which is going to be exploring dodging and burning, which is a very powerful process inside of Adobe Photoshop to not only potentially use it for retouching of skin, but you can also use it to augment the three-dimensionality within the image. And that's how I use it all the time in my work. Thanks for watching today. And until next time, I will see you out there in the world of Photoshop.